uh, the Lord saved me, and uh, he changed me, and he's still working on me. Is he still working on you? Amen. All right. Well, open your Bibles to chapter number 32. You may give you a book, too, that I have to do everything. <laughs> How about Numbers? Numbers 32. <laughs> the book of Numbers. Thank you for being here tonight. I appreciate the faithful folks who think it's important enough to come to church on Sunday night and uh, love the Lord. I know there's some people who are probably not able to come to church from time to time because of their health conditions or they're traveling or something, but uh, I, I admire and appreciate so much the people who are able to come, and they come faithfully. And... Uh, you guys are the, you guys are the faithful ones tonight, and uh, most of you here tonight, you're here all the time. You come, you just come all the time, and I, I really appreciate that. I think of people like this little group over here is talking now while I'm talking, and <laughs> no, they, these folks are, these are some of my favorite people right over here. That, those two couples right there are, uh, are special treasures. I love them, and and uh, brother Danny and Miss Mary faced their share of the health problems and brother Danny still hacks on that grass and, and cuts grass and I appreciate uh, brother Al cutting grass this summer and brother Ted's done some of it and who else we had somebody else too didn't we cutting on the grass brother Danny's been, had some health problems but he's still he's still working on it hadn't given up and I uh, appreciate Jimmy and Brenda man they're just I bet you could count on one hand the services they've missed since they've been in this church how many years now brother Jimmy Miss Brenda five years it's been longer than that hasn't it huh I think it's been longer than that yeah seems like it was over five years ago when you uh, made that smart aleck remark about the Louisiana hot sauce <laughs> we, were, we were having a fall cookout down uh, down at Ricky's place down there at Higginson and uh, and I, Jimmy and Brenda just started coming to church and we were going through the line there fixing our hot dogs, and I was sprinkling some Louisiana hot sauce on my hot dog. And I looked at Miss Brenda and said, here, you want some of this? You ought to put some of it on your hot dog. It'll make you good looking. I eat it all the time. She said, preacher, all I can say is just keep on trying. <laughs> <laughs> she fit in real good, didn't she? <laughs> but they're faithful. They're here all the time. Man, I wish everybody was uh, just faithful like that. Numbers 32 in verse number 23. We're just going to read one verse to get our text tonight. I'm going to preach on the subject, the sin of omission. The sin of omission. Numbers 32, verse 23. And uh, we'll, we'll read some of the context or talk about some of the context of it in just a minute, but I just want to read this one verse and then we'll pray. Verse 23 says, But if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin We'll find you out. We probably all heard that verse at some time or another. Might not have been able to just turn to it immediately in our Bible, but we probably heard it over and over again throughout our Christian life. Be sure your sin will find you out. Like the little boy that uh, stole one of his dad's watermelons. He wasn't supposed to eat it. The family's going to eat it together, and, and the, the watermelon disappeared. And dad asked the little boy, he said, Did you get that watermelon? He said, No, sir. And he said it was the next year that Dad was out there doing some weed eating around the garage and a bunch of watermelon vines had sprouted and started growing along the back side of that garage and he found the scene of the crime. <laughs> and so he took the little boy out there and he said, look at all these watermelons growing here. You know anything about that? And the little boy looked at him and said, yes, sir. That's where I ate it. <laughs> and uh, your sin will find you out. It'll sprout find you out. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that you'd bless us, and uh, Lord, speak to our hearts, and Father, if we just need to be spoken to gently, I pray that that's just exactly what we'd get. Lord, if you need to shake us, or if you need to uh, encourage us, Lord, if you need to instruct us, I pray that that's what you'd do. I believe we're all here tonight as mature Christians who just want to grow in the grace of the Lord, and I believe, Lord, that you can speak to us in a way that we're willing to hear. And I pray that you'd bless us for being here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, 
There's a lot of things that we can be sure of. Somebody said the only thing in life you can be sure of is death and taxes. Well, that seems to be so. There seems to be no escape from it, but there may be a lot of other things that you can be sure of. But one thing you can be sure of, according to the Bible, it says be sure your sin will find you out. Be sure your sin will find you out. Now, there's a certain kind of sin that he's talking about here. What kind of sin is it? It's, the, it's not the sin of the flesh. It's not, uh, it's not the sin like drunkenness or drug abuse or adultery and fornication. There's, uh, there's also sins of the spirit like pride and anger and envy and jealousy and so forth, selfishness. Then there's the sins of disposition like being hostile and and uh, there's national sins and domestic sins and there's all kinds of classifications of sins but in the context of this passage I think we'll find this to be a classification of sin that kind of stands by itself and it's called the sin of omission now this, this scripture that we just read that single verse that we read takes place you'll remember boys and girls you remember when the children of Israel were in bondage down in Egypt and they came out right? they came out and they wandered where? in the wilderness and uh, the, as they wandered through the wilderness God was directing them towards the promised land and, uh, and they got up to the promised land and, and uh, they didn't go in uh, they were disobedient to God and they had to wander for 40 years out there in the wilderness and finally uh, that generation died off and they got up to the uh, Jordan River when it was time to move into the promised land again they finally uh, got up there and uh, Moses is telling them when they do enter in, he's, he's talking about going over and fighting uh, with their brethren or fighting uh, for their brethren against the enemy. And uh, so there's two tribes there. They're on the east bank of Jordan, and uh, they're contemplating moving across to the other side. And uh, two tribes there are wanting to stay on the east side. Get, tribes of Gad and Reuben and Gad and Reuben say hey man we, we're just looking at all this grass all this grazing land here man look at those fields of tall thick lush grass those meadows man wouldn't this be a wonderful place to have our sheep grazing on these pasture lands this just looks like the kind of place where we'd like to stay on the east side of Jordan so they're wanting to stay over there and uh, so the instructions are given. If you guys stay on this side, if you really want to stay on this side, God gave us the other side, but if you want to stay on this side, that's okay. But when your brethren go across the Jordan and go on the other side, there's going to be an enemy over there, and there's going to be battles to fight. And uh, Gad and Reuben, you guys, it wouldn't, be, uh, it wouldn't be right for you to stay on that side while your brothers go to... Uh, go to battle against uh, the enemy that's in the land and so what you need to do is be ready to go to battle and fight with your brothers when they go across the river and so he gives them instructions he says now when you go across and the battle gets hot we call for you guys to come on over our brothers need to come and help us and that's what you need to do and if not and if not he says these words, But if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Now that's the sin of omission. He's given them something to do, and if they leave out that which is commanded to do, then they have sinned. And I submit to you tonight that the sins of the flesh are not the worst sins. The sins of commission are nothing more than symptoms of, of the greater sin of omission. If we do that which is right, we won't commit the sins that are wrong to do. So the sins of commission are the symptoms of the sin of omission. In James chapter 4, verse 17, the Bible says, To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is what? Sin. If we know to do good, and we do it not, to him it is is sin. I want to show you three things tonight about this terrible sin of omission. Number one, it's a very destructive sin. A very destructive sin. God brings judgment upon people 
not primarily because of what they do, but because of what they didn't do. The sin of omission. For example, when Jesus cursed the fig tree, it was not because that tree had poisonous fruit on it. It was not because it had bad fruit on it. What was the, what was the problem? Why did Jesus curse the fig tree? It had no fruit. The tree didn't bear. And uh, you'll see that same thing passed over and over again. When Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan, uh, the man that went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, the Bible says that he fell among the thieves and he's laying there half dead. And after they've robbed him, they've beaten him, and he's about to die. And along comes a priest and a Levite. And they are condemned by the words of Jesus in this story, not because they beat the man up, not because they robbed him, not because of anything they did to him. Why did Jesus tell this story? He said it's because of what they didn't do, the sin of omission. If we commit the sin of omission, it opens the door for the sin of commission. What about the parable of talents? Jesus told about the parable of the talents. Remember, he gave, uh, he gave different gifts to different men and said, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to invest this talent and I want you to make it grow. And when I come back, I want to see what you've done for me. And so the first showed what he had done. He had had increase. The second showed him what he had done. But wait a minute. What about the guy that went and dug and hid his talent in the earth? He didn't do anything. That was the problem. That was the problem. He called him a wicked and slothful servant. Not because of what he had done. Oftentimes we get very self-righteous and very holy and, uh, and we say, man, at least I'm not a drunkard. I don't do dope. I don't dip nor chew nor run with women who do. I'm not doing all of those terrible things. But wait, the sin of omission is the sin that causes those other things to happen. If we're, doing what, if we're doing what we ought to do, we won't do those things that we should not do. I heard about the employer that uh, said to his employee, he said, you're fired. And the guy said, well, why'd you fire me? I didn't do anything. He said, that's why you're fired. <laughs> you didn't do anything. Now, the Bible calls this the sin of omission or the sin of neglect. And uh, God judges us not so much for what we do that's wrong, but for what we don't do, what we have failed to do. Do you know what most of us do? Most of us spend time trying to avoid the sins that we ought not to be doing. And we fail to do the things that we ought to do. We put our emphasis oftentimes in the wrong place. Let me show you a verse of Scripture to show you what I mean. Romans chapter 12, verse 21. Turn there with me. Romans chapter 12, and verse 21. The Apostle Paul brings this out very nicely. It's not what we do, but what we don't do that's the bigger sin. In Romans chapter 12, verse 21, Paul says, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with what? With good. You see, it's the good that we do that roots out the evil that we should not do. Some little boy said uh, when he heard about the sins, sins of omission, he said the sins of omission are the sins we ought to have committed, but we didn't. <laughs> no. Sins of uh, omission are things we should have done, but we didn't. Uh, why are men lost anyway? Charles Manson, he's still on. Remember the guy that killed all those people, uh, uh, Sharon Tate, the Sharon Tate murders, and, and they, they did this creepy crawly thing where they would crawl into people's houses at night and they'd lay down on their belly and crawl through the house so nobody would be able to see them crawling around and they murdered people in, in their own home. Now Charles Manson was a maniacal, demon-possessed killer. I mean, you can tell it by looking at the man. I've seen these pictures. He just looks evil. He looks wicked. He's a dirty, rotten, low-down low down murderer. But you know he won't go to hell because of all of the horrible sins he's committed. You know, the, the good old boy that lives down the street that's lost, but he's a good citizen, a good neighbor. He'll help you out. He'll do anything for you. Give you the shirt off of his back, and he's just a good guy. 
but he'll go to hell together with Charles Manson. Not because he committed so many horrible, heinous crimes, but because he failed to do something. What did he fail to do? He failed to receive the payment that Jesus made on the cross of Calvary. Hey, the same salvation, the same blood covers the, the sins of Charles Manson and, and Adolf Hitler and, and uh, Mussolini and all of the worst killers in the world. Mao Zedong, you name them, all of the horrible killers, they'll go to the same devil's hell as the good old boy down the street who just didn't receive Christ as Savior. Well, it's what they left out. In fact, John 3.18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So it's what has been left out. Now let's think about this. Think with me just a moment in our, in our spiritual life. Think about this. Now we talked about the lost man and uh, leaving out the salvation that Jesus has provided for him, but think about this, those of us who are saved. Uh, what causes people to be weak in their spiritual life? You say, well, it's probably because they're going to the wrong places and doing things they shouldn't do and running with the crowd they shouldn't run with. Well, all of those things may be true of them, and those things are not justified, but that's not the primary problem. The primary problem is what they've left out. Look at it this way. Let's say... Let's say if I, uh, if I go over to somebody's house and, and a friend and, and see about him, hadn't been to church in a long, long time, months and months, and I go to see about him and, and he's uh, sitting there in a chair in the living room and he looks very frail and pale and, and, uh, and man, he just looks like an old skeleton that's wasting away. And I say, man, what's wrong with you? He said, well, he said, preacher, I'm just, I'm so weak, I can't hardly get out of the chair. If I go to the bathroom to shave, I can hardly lift my hand up to my face. And, and uh, I can't even take a bath alone. I, I can't hardly walk across the floor. I'm just so weak. I said, well, man, what's, uh, are you sick with something? Have you eaten something, got food poisoning or something? And he said, oh, no. No, it's not anything I ate because I don't eat anything. I said, you don't eat anything? Nobody in this crowd would be accused of that. <laughs> he says, uh, no, I don't eat anything. Well, he said, on Sunday, you know, I'll, I'll eat three or four bites on Sunday, but that's about it. And I say, well, good night, man. You're not eating anything, and, and you're weak, and you, you're wondering why. If you're not eating, no wonder. You're starved to death. You're malnourished. You're not getting anything. And, and I submit to you that the, the person who is saved and is not feeding upon the Word of God, not feeding upon the things of God, not living in, uh, in, in uh, close communion with the Lord, not having a prayer time, not having Bible reading time, not having devotion, not going to church, not going to Sunday school, not getting any nutrition, then no wonder we're weak, not in our body, but in our spirit. No wonder we're weak. You see, <coughs> Job said in 23, 12, I have desired the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. <coughs> there are a lot of people who won't go out of the house without having breakfast. <laughs> Just got to have breakfast. Some people, can't, uh, some people can't work in the afternoon if they hadn't had lunch. That's not Brother Jimmy, man. He won't even eat lunch. He just keeps on working. <laughs> but some people got to have lunch. You got to have a little nutrition to keep on going. And a lot of people just uh, not going go to not gonna go to bed without supper. Our oldest boy, Clan, was uh, one night when he was a little bitty boy, he was, uh, he was in the kitchen eating one night. It was bedtime, and he's in there, got him a bowl of cereal, and, man, he's just chowing down. His mom said, son, what are you doing eating this late? He said, I missed breakfast this morning. <laughs> you know, kind of getting cheated out. Of his, he's going to have his Cheerios before he goes to bed, and he was serious about it. You know, we got to have some food, and our spirit has to have some food. And the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn, newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow by there, thereby. Now, here's what happens. People get saved and they think they're just doing fine. They've already got a few Sunday school classes under their belt. They read through their Bible in a year. And so uh, they're doing fine. Why do they need to go to church? Why do they need to read the word of God? They've already been through it. I like what Howard Hendricks said one time to some old man that was 
in the church. He was trying to help the church to uh, establish some new Sunday school classes and grow. And, and, uh, and uh, he asked uh, this man uh, in the church, he said, ask him a question about the Bible, and that man was offended. He said, I'll have you know, sir, I've been through the Bible three times. And Howard Hendricks said, well, that's great. How many times has the Bible been through you? You know, we, what we need is the Word of God to permeate us, not to do a speed reading course through it. We need it to, to take a, 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 a fertile place in our heart and grow. The same thing can be said about our prayer life. Now, we're talking about sins of omission, right? Same, same thing can be said of our prayer life. Remember <clears throat> on the night when the disciples were, uh, were told to watch and pray, Mark 14, 38, here's what Jesus said. He said, watch and pray... <coughs> <clears throat> excuse me, lest you enter into temptation. And you say, well, that old, old Peter, man, he really failed the Lord. He cursed, denied the Lord. Well, that's true, he did. But I wonder if he had followed the Lord's instructions, if he had watched and prayed, if that same result would have happened. Do you remember what happened? Jesus went off to pray by himself. He, goes, he says, you guys watch and pray here, and I'm going yonder and pray. And he went off and prayed for a little bit, and he came back, and he said, they're all laying there asleep. And he said, men, wake up. It's not the time to sleep now. Watch and pray. And he went back to pray again, and he came back, and what are they doing? They're snoozing again. If they had watched and prayed, if our prayer life is what it ought to be, if they pray, if we earnestly pray about the problems we have, maybe we wouldn't have so many failures to complain about. And uh, let's go ahead and think about our thought life. Some people say, man, I just can't help. My mind just gets going and I've got all these thoughts running through my mind and I'm thinking about all these things. Maybe I've got a problem with lust or I've got this problem with greed. I've got this problem of thinking about uh, other people and, and I've just got all these thoughts and I just can't get those thoughts out of my mind. You know, uh, <laughs> your, your thoughts are kind of like your body. Your body can't be in two places at one time. And neither can your mind. If you think about one thing, you're not going to be thinking about another thing. So the sin of omission is what? The Bible teaches that we ought to pray and we ought to think about certain things. You can't think two thoughts at the same time. And uh, so if we put the right thoughts in, it doesn't leave room for the wrong thoughts. You see what I'm saying? Somebody asked a little boy, said, how do you spell vacuum? He said, man, I vacuum. He said, I can't do it right now, but I've got it in my head. And I think a lot of us have got the vacuum <laughs> in our head sometimes. We may have it there and just can't get it out. You know what? Your mind is not a vacuum. If you allow a vacuum to happen in your mind, then anything can rush in. And that's when the devil takes the opportunity. The Bible says in Psalm 119.9, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? Are you listening, young men? If you have a problem thinking about things you shouldn't think about, it says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Psalm 119.11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Then Philippians chapter 4, and verse number 8, we're talking about filling the vacuum. You can't think of two things at once. So the key is, don't have the sin of omission, so you have the sins of commission. So what you do is fill your mind with the right thought. Philippians 4.8 says, Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. So we have the privilege choose what we think about. If we put the right thoughts in, we have not committed the sin of omission. What about our marriages? We can think about our marriages in the same way. The sin of omission. We said that what does a lost man have to do to go to hell? Nothing. <laughs> he doesn't have to do one thing to go to hell. A lost man can just sit back and destruction will come. What about your marriage? If your marriage is not cultivated, the weeds are going to grow and it's not going to be a good marriage. 
What, what causes a good marriage? A marriage is not a diamond that is set on a shelf to admire every once in a while or a gold ring that you put on your finger and look at once in a while. You know what a marriage is? A marriage is a beautiful flower that needs to be cultivated and have the weeds pulled out around it. It needs to be watered and nourished and that's what your marriage is. Our marriage is better than it was in the past because we nourish our marriage. We're both committed to making our marriage grow and flourish and be a, a beautiful flower. Now there's a weed that sprouts up every once in a while. You yank the weeds up, water it, feed it, and keep it growing. <laughs> flower, that's what your marriage is. And so what do you do to destroy your marriage? Well, you say, man beats his wife or curses his wife, he'll destroy his marriage. Yeah, and I'll tell you something else. If he doesn't do anything, he'll probably destroy his marriage. Omission. The sin of omission. What causes somebody to run off, a man to run off with somebody else's wife? Probably because they hadn't been cultivating their marriage. Now you sit around and think up, don't sit around and think up what she ought to be doing. You figure out what you ought to be doing. Amen? Same thing, the sin of omission, the same thing is true about church. Our church will be as great as we want it to be, as we cause it to be. Now, I understand the Lord's the one that grows the church, but he grows the church generally and blesses a church in proportion to the love that the people have for their church and the attention that they give to it, just, again, like the marriage. So what do you have to do to destroy a church? Well, going back to the analogy of the lost man, what does the lost man do to go to hell? What does he do to face destruction? Nothing. What do we have to do to see our church destroyed? <laughs> Nothing. Just sit back and neglect it, and it'll be destroyed. Here's something I thought was interesting. I'll read it to you. You like to, you like to be read to? Huh? You kids like somebody to read you a story? <laughs> Let me read you a story. It's short. There was a man who lived in the 20th century. His house was new, and he had two cars, and a boat graced his garage and carport, and had a full home theater, Gleaming in his den, his family was healthy. and Low good fortune did smile upon him. And as was his custom when he was in town, when the fish were not biting, and he was not at the lake, when the company didn't come, and when he could get up on time, and when he was not too tired, and when there was nothing else he could do, he regularly went to church. The Sunday school was low in attendance. The choir was scanty, the congregation was small, the offering was poor, and the preacher was discouraged. And that man said to himself, they ought to do better than this. What do they think religion is about anyway? Surely they could do better than this. So vacation and days off came and went until many moons had passed, and as is the way of the world, this man's children grew up he knew that they did not go to church because the times down at the church had not interested them in religion. The man's health failed. One day he noticed something strange happen. People down at the church stopped coming by his house to see him anymore. They didn't visit at all. And verily, verily, he was angry. But being great in heart, he decided he would forgive them and go to church once more. But behold, when he arrived, there was no church, only a 7-Eleven store. Where's the church, he demanded. Dead was the answer. Oh, he moaned, they should not have let it die. What do you have to do to kill a church? Just neglect it. That's why I say every once in a while, we're having church on Sunday night. We're going we're gonna to have a vote to see whether to keep it open or not. If you show up, that's a vote to keep it open. Oh, what's the other vote? <laughs> well, the sin of omission. I'm talking about the sin of omission. That's not so much what we do, it's, it's what we don't do. Sin of omission. It's the sin out of which all other sins grow. It's the sin which causes people to end up in hell. It's the sin that if you are saved, that keeps you from being victorious in your Christian life. 
It's the sin that will blight your marriage. It's the sin that will shut down your church. It's the sin that is simply failing to do what you ought to do. Some folks are watching by internet tonight. Thank God if you're unable to get out of the house, thank God you're watching. We appreciate you and I always want you to watch. If you're able to be in church, you ought to go. It's what you ought to do. Number two, it's not only a destructive sin, but it's a deceiving sin. <clears throat> it's such a deceiving sin. You, say, <clears throat> you see, if, if your preacher ended up getting drunk on Saturday night and running through town throwing beer cans out the windows and, and uh, raising cane all night long and ended up in jail instead of being able to preach on Sunday morning, everybody would say, well, it's easy to see what happened to him. It would be easy to see, wouldn't it? Do you know what makes the sin of omission so dangerous? It's so respectable. You can't see it. Usually you just can't see it. It's deceptive, even to ourselves. Sin is not so much doing what's wrong. It's failing to do what's right. And again, I want to remind you of James 4, 17. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin and I'll tell you what happens when we fail to do good it, it just opens everything up for the devil to walk right in when, when God told Saul to sacrifice and to kill all the cattle of the Amalekites and uh, he failed to do that he failed he neglected he omitted the part that God told him to do when he left out what God told him to do. Here's what Samuel said. He said, To obey is better than sacrifice, to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. It's as the iniquity and witchcraft. Well, that's what he said. Well, if God's told us to pray for somebody, we don't pray, we leave it out. Is that sin? See, sometimes God lays somebody on our heart that we ought to pray for. It might not be on a prayer list. It might be just somebody that God brought to your heart. And if God brings it to your heart, that may be more important than the printed list you've got. And uh, we leave it out. The Holy Spirit told us. But here's what Samuel said in, in chapter 12, 23. Samuel said this. He said, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. So just failing to pray for somebody if the Holy Spirit has put upon our heart would be sin. Ezekiel 3.18. What about witnessing to somebody? What about telling somebody that they, uh, that they need the Lord? What about telling somebody about Jesus? Ezekiel 3.18 says this, When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Hey, here's what he's saying. Listen, he's saying there, is, there are wicked people everywhere. Wicked people are just running here and yonder trying to commit all of their wicked and ungodly sins. And they're dying and going to hell by the multitudes. And he says to us who are Christians, hey, he's saying I've given you the message, I've given you the gospel, and you're to share it with people to try to keep them out of hell. And if we fail to do that, yeah, they'll go to hell. But the Bible's saying God holds us responsible for that failure to get them saved. Suppose, suppose there's a man on death row at a prison in Arkansas. And he's scheduled to be executed by lethal injection. And there's a group of... Uh, neighbors and concerned citizens who have discovered some circumstances that, that suggest that the governor ought to pardon this man. And they go before the governor and they petition the governor and they show him their, their plea and they say, Governor, we, 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 think, you ought to, we think you ought to pardon this man. He, he does not deserve to be executed. And the governor looks at their evidence and looks at it and he says, You know, I kind of agree with you. I think the man should be pardoned. And he writes out the pardon. And he calls me up on the phone. 
And he says, Brooks, I want you to carry this pardon over there to the warden at the penitentiary and uh, give this pardon to the warden so this man is not executed. And so he hands it to me, and I stuff it in my coat pocket. I think, well, I don't have to go right now. I'd really planned on going down to the driving range and hitting a few golf balls this afternoon, and it's supposed to rain tomorrow. And so I go hit some golf balls. And the next day, it doesn't rain. I say, man, it didn't rain. No doubt the fish would be biting in a little red. Those trout would be jumping out of the water, and I decided to go fishing. And then a few days later, things just keep happening. And I find other things to do. And then one morning, I pick up the Daily Citizen, and on the front page, it says, man executed at state penitentiary by lethal injection. I think, oh my, I've still got that in my pocket. How would you feel if that was you? You had the pardon. You could have carried it to the man, and you didn't do it. I think that'd make us feel pretty bad, wouldn't it? You know what? One day we'll stand before God, and the Bible says every man will give an account. And if we, hey, didn't do anything wrong, just played some golf, just went fishing, just had some fun, didn't do anything bad. All but it's a sin of omission that allowed the man to be executed. And if somebody needs the gospel, now we can't witness to everybody. But surely we could witness to somebody. Amen. Well, let me give you number three. It's a very determined sin. Not only is it destructive and deceptive, but it's very determined. Watch, look in, in our text verse again, Numbers 32 and verse 23. The last part of that verse says, Your sin will find you out. It will. It's going to happen. It will find you out. Sin, sin is, the sin of omission is like a bloodhound. It's going to be on your trail no matter where you go and no matter how long it takes you to get there. That bloodhound will find you. Your sin will find you out. When uh, my dog Poncho was a little puppy, I'd go out and, uh, and I'd try to do my walking, my cardio walking in the morning, and I'd, uh, I'd go out and I want to walk down the, down the county road. It's paved and you don't have to wade through the... The, the wet grass, you know, do, do my walking. I've got a place where I can walk around the orchard and all, but it's usually uh, heavy dew and it's just wet out there, and I'd rather walk out on the blacktop. But my dog wants to follow me. And cars come along, and they kind of see me, but they don't see him. He's just a little guy. And so I would try to, I'd try to get out there and do my walking uh, without Poncho finding me. And he was short enough, he couldn't get through the tall grass very fast, so I'd get outside and I'd... I'd run around the side of the chicken house and try to go around the other end and I figure he won't be able to get through the grass and find me I'll be gone I'll be out on the road and gone and so I run around the chicken house and just as I get ready to get out on the road I look and there he is hopping along through the grass he caught up with me already I'd try to go I'd, I'd, I'll, I'll lose him at the barn I'll go down to the barn and I'll get him interested in something else and so I'd go down to the barn and I'd pick up a rock and throw it over in the bushes he'd take off running over in the bushes see what that sound was and I'd turn and go the other way I'd get to the mailbox, and I'd look, and I'd hear these little feet clattering right behind me. There he is. I could hide from him. I'd, I'd go hide someplace where he couldn't find me. I'd climb up in the barn loft where he couldn't smell me. And he's nowhere to be found. But as soon as I climb down and hit that black top, here he is again. He'd find me every time. He's got a good nose. <laughs> sin, the sin of omission is that way. It's got a good nose. It'll find you out. Because God is in charge of finding out. You know, I guess the fact that the sin of omission is kind of a respectable sin. I mean, it's not getting drunk. It's not doing drugs. It's not robbing a bank. It's not, uh, <clears throat> it's not cursing somebody, getting in fights. It's not committing fornication or being in jail. The sin of omission is just a respectable thing, you know, and, and, and it's so deceiving and it is so persistent that it'll find us sooner or later. I mean, it just comes along and catches up with us. And nobody, nobody thinks much about it because 
I can't honestly look at you. I don't know what God's told you to do. If God's told you to pray, pray for somebody, I don't know that. So you could neglect it, and I wouldn't ever know. God may have told you to give something in a special offering, and you didn't do it. Well, I wouldn't ever know. God told you to do that. People around you won't ever know. So do you see the temptation? Because it's such a respectable thing that nobody else knows? then you can get by with it, but only for a period of time. And then it says what? It will find you out. If a lost man dies without Christ, he goes to hell for doing nothing. All he has to do is just sit still until he dies and he goes. And a person who is saved can fail to ever grow in grace and nobody might not spot it because it's not anything we're doing outwardly it's just something we're leaving out but God knows and you can't you can't try to drive it out of your life because the sin of omission is something that needs to come into your life it's something that we're leaving out it's kind of like if you go into a dark room you go into a dark room and you say, I want to get rid of the darkness in here. You can pick up a broom and you can try to beat the darkness out of that room and drive it out, but it, it's never going to leave. What needs to happen? You open up the door and you open up the windows, pull the shades back and let the light come in. It's not so much, look, here's what I'm saying. We may have some sins that are sins of commission, things that we do that are obviously wrong but instead of trying to drive those sins out maybe what we need is to open up the curtains and let the light shine in and then the light drives the darkness out I found this to be true that when people love God like they ought to the sin the darkness of sin is usually driven away when they love God like they ought to the sin of omission Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd bless us. Lord, reveal to us if we have left out things in our life that we really ought to be doing. Lord, I pray that you'd reveal it to us. And I pray that everybody in this room tonight would just be honest with themselves. I don't know. They don't know about me, and I don't know about them. But I pray, Lord, that if there are things that we've neglected, maybe it's our prayer life. Lord, I've got to tell you, it's just a demission. You know it. But I need to uh, pay more attention to my prayer life. Lord, about witnessing. I do witness to a few people, but Lord, I've neglected to witness to others. And Lord, I pray that you'd help me to deal with the sins of omission. Loving people. I love some people, but maybe I need to love some people more. And I pray that each of us would look into our own heart tonight, allow the Holy Spirit to search and find our omissions and to deal with them before they lead to sins of commission. Lord, I pray that you'd bless us as we go into the invitation time. Lord, help us to be very honest with you. And Lord, I pray that if there are any under the sound of my voice, either on the Internet or audio, Lord, I pray that if they're not saved tonight, I pray that they realize if they just sit there and do nothing, they surely will end up in hell. But that there has been a remedy for their sin. It's the blood of Jesus. It's already been offered. Sins are paid for. And they can receive it by trusting in him. I pray that they'd be saved tonight. Bless our invitation now in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. Would you stand, please? As she plays, the invitation is open. You can come. Just kneel at the altar and pray. Ask God to shine a light in your heart.